Hello and welcome to the Lifting the Iceberg podcast. My name is Tyler James Berger, and on this episode, I have a discussion with Dr. Tom Berent. Dr. Berent is a professor of religion at Temple University whose work focuses primarily on the veneration or worship of animals and nature in different religious traditions throughout history. I first met Dr. Berent when I took his earth ethics class at Temple and continued to have discussions with him in this field when I joined his pagan studies club, where we looked deeply into nature-based religious traditions. In this episode, we explore the broad question of how religion mediates humanity's relationship with the natural world. So please welcome Dr. Tom Berent. So I'm sitting here with Dr. Thomas Berent. Tom, thanks for doing this. Oh, my pleasure. Nice to see you again, Tyler. Yeah, nice to see you again, too. I'm really excited to talk to you about the intersection between religion and eco-psychology. Eco-psychology being the field that looks at how our human psychology causes us to behave towards the natural world. Mm -hmm. And you're an expert in this intersection particularly when it, in regards to how religion influences human behavior with how we live with or against nature. And religion, very much so, is like an operating system. And this is something Terence McKenna talked about. Mm -hmm. We are living on Christianity 2.0, or we're living on Gaia 2.0. It's, it's like a different operating system from which all of our behaviors manifest. Mm -hmm. um, and I wanted to ask you, in what way do you think that religions act as operating systems? And what relation could a culture's religious tradition have on the way that people treat the natural world? Yeah, so I think the first thing to clarify is what is religion? Mm -hmm. So you have a specific uh, model of interpreting what is religion. Like in the study of religion, there are so many different definitions and theories of what is religion. Um, the working model or theory that I use is that everything is religion. Um, religion does not specify the belief in a God, doesn't have to specify a belief in the afterlife, doesn't have to specify any specific belief. Instead, as one of our um, truly remarkable professors at Temple, Rebecca Alpert, highlights, um, religion is any form of belief, behavior, or belonging to which you perceive reality. Mm -hmm. And if there is anything that you um, attribute any form of care, devotion, belonging, in that it impacts what you believe and impacts your behavior, then it can be a religion. So mm -hmm. in our hegemonic culture in America, Christianity capitalism, consumerism, sport, Hollywood, um, popular culture, all these things have a huge impact on how we perceive reality. And how we conduct ourselves. In Absolutely. Reality. Yeah. And I think that we're talking specifically about um, eco-psychology, mm -hmm. but it could be gender. It, it could be how we um, perceive the afterlife. It could be how we perceive any purpose it's connected to the lens to which we see things. Um, a feminist called Donna Haraway, she wrote um, many wonderful things, including the Cyborg Manifesto. Mm -hmm. But one of her pieces she wrote called Situated Knowledge discusses how everything that we perceive comes from a specific positioning. So depending on our parents, depending on our schooling, depending on the religion we're raised in, be that a religion which we call a religion or be it a form of cultural practice which mm -hmm. we don't deem religion these things will influence the lens that we perceive things with mm -hmm. so absolutely any form of lens we have will impact how we perceive reality and reality being the earth we live on um, the earth which is nature the earth which is um anything that lives, anything that we believe to have sentience, um, 
we perceive it dependent upon our positioning. Mm -hmm. And there's a strong cultural correlation to how religions manifest in different cultures around the world. But uh, someone whose work that I've been really interested in is Ernest Becker. And Mm -hmm. he wrote a book called The Denial of Death, Mm -hmm. where he outlines this theory as to how religion is just a way for humanity to transcend death anxiety. He asserts that man is literally split in two. He has an awareness of his own splendid uniqueness in that he sticks out of nature with a towering majesty, and yet he goes back into the ground a few feet in order to blindly and dumbly rot and disappear forever. Um, this is the terrifying dilemma that we, the human, that characterizes the human condition. Uh, so much so that uh, Erwin Yalom, who wrote a book called Existential Psychotherapy, he says to cope with the fear of death, we erect defenses against death awareness, defenses that are based on denial that shape our character structure and that, if maladaptive, result in clinical syndromes. So in other words, psychopathology is the result of ineffective modes of death transcendence. And religion is one of the primary modalities that human beings use to deal with the fact that we have we're so um cephalized in our as the result of our evolution where we've become too aware for our own good because the awareness of death is crippling at the most fundamental level and Mm -hmm. we need to find ways of transcending this and a bunch of religions around the world go about this by trying to preach that human beings are something other than nature, that we have a a divine element to our being that makes us more than just an animal. You know, angels, you never see an image of an angel with any genitals Mm -hmm. because uh, angels are, or angels don't need to eat. They are immortal beings that transcend the the animalistic acts of eating and shitting that define a mortal being. Mm-hmm. Um, so our religious structures that aim to help us transcend our death anxiety lead us into thinking that we are something other than animals. We're something above nature. And this causes us to other nature. It causes us to think of it as something separate from ourselves. And I think this is where we come into a lot of trouble because when we think that we are something other than nature, it gives us like a free pass to destroy it, Mm -hmm. you know? And um, I think that another quote by a guy named Theodore Rosak who wrote um, one of the landmark texts on eco-psychology called eco-psychology, when the sense of self is extended to include the natural world, any behaviors leading to the destruction of that world will be experienced as self-destruction. Mm. And I think this is this gets to the crux of where we need to go with um, collective attitudes towards the human relationship with the environment. You see in a lot of like climate change activists, they'll show you pictures of a beautiful polar bear or, or pictures of the animals and the nature that are being destroyed as the result of human activities. And they're going off of, oh, look how beautiful nature is. Shouldn't we save it? Mm-hmm. But really, it's not that we're destroying nature. It's that we're destroying ourselves because mm-hmm. we're not separated from nature. Yeah. It, we are so, so a part of it. And I think that coming to a religious system that allows us to live with nature, we need to find a way to come to terms with our mortality while still recognizing and cherishing, cherishing and worshiping nature as something a part of us and not something separate from us, not something that we need to transcend and remove ourselves from. So how do we go about doing that? Or how do different religions uh, deal with um, mortality? 
mm. a, and while maintaining a relationship with the natural world? Well, I think that there are so many different things you raised there. To begin with, the problem lies in the fact that we perceive ourselves as not nature. Yeah. So when people make the claim, I need to spend more time in nature, in that statement, they're making the claim that they are not nature mm -hmm. already. And the truth is we are nature. We are not born as we know of it from another planet, even though some people believe that maybe angels, Nephilim, Arcturians, aliens came down and created us and caused us to be more intellectual or more spiritual or gave us some form of reason that um, allows us to think that we are more privileged or more exceptional. Mm -hmm. The truth is, with what we know right now, is that we're nature. We are an extension of nature. On our hands, we have as much bacteria as anywhere else. We have thousands of different types of bacteria roaming on our skin, bacteria in our stomach, all for our body. There's 10 to 1 bacteria cells to human cells. Mm -hmm. So we're walking ecosystems. All it takes for us to really appreciate nature is to look at our hand and imagine bacteria cities thriving. Mm -hmm. interacting, having sex, roaming through your hair as if it's a forest. But all that bacteria on our skin is just waiting for us to die so it can, so it can decompose us and eat us. It, like, how do you reconcile the terror that kind of comes with that notion that nature is constantly trying to kill us? Well, that once again is the idea that we're not nature, mm. that we're somehow not a part of an ecosystem. Mm. If we perceive ourselves to be in some, um, what Roy Rappaport, um, a famous um, anthropologist first discussed, um, the cybernetics of the holy, mm -hmm. then humanity is supposed to be playing a role in a system. Mm -hmm. whereby we're regulating the system. Where we might die, but we are also bringing life exactly. to the system we that we're a part life. of. We are death. Mm -hmm. That we are both producing through our actions and through our non-actions. Mm -hmm. That we are a part of a system which is greater than us. What most religions have produced is the idea that humans are above everything else. Mm -hmm. And that we are somehow made in the image of some deity or an image of some alien race, or some form of magical, divine, cosmic presence, which we channel more so than anything else on this planet. And that combined with, as you say, some complex about death, some mortality threat, to think that we are constantly on some linear progress to get somewhere. Mm -hmm. In embracing nature as a part of ourselves, we start embracing the cyclical instead of the linear. Mm -hmm. We understand that we're a part of something. Mm -hmm. We're a part of an ecosphere, an ecosystem. We are not in a hierarchy where we're at the top. Yeah, and I love this because this is really like a, a grounded, almost scientific way of transcending death because the only thing that dies when we die is our ego. You know what I mean? Like we might Which die. Which we know of. You know, once again, we don't know. And when people talk about spirit mediums, when they talk about talking with their ancestors, they're talking with someone who knows that they mm. were that person before. Mm. So maybe our ego, stroke personality, stroke soul, whatever different level that is, maybe it does exist in another dimension. Mm -hmm. We exist in a very specific 3D, 4D dimension. Mm -hmm. There's talks of nine dimensions. Well, even if there were dimensions of our being... Uh, or aspects of our being that were sourced from other dimensions. They're only just kind of like poking through into this reality through our bio biological meat suit. You know what I mean? And just because your body dies doesn't mean that uh, eternal source of your being dies too. Yeah, and this works on two levels because your biological, physical self gets regenerated as new life. Mm -hmm. So that's one. And two, the energetic level... We don't know. Mm -hmm. Like we have many theories. We have many religions and philosophies and new age practices that talk about our body being a vessel for energy. Be it Reiki, be it Tai Chi, be it Taoism, be it Hinduism. Any of these traditions talk about how 
we channel prana, we, we channel chi, we channel some form of life force energy mm -hmm. that gives us more potential if we're open to it. Yeah, and, and in this view, death is not a punctuation no. as much as it is a transformation. Um, and how do different religion, how exactly does this relate to how religions uh, of people of different religious faiths behave towards nature? Can you give some specific examples of, of people with a particular religion and a religious structure that behave differently towards their natural environment than another? Absolutely. So if we, if we take just the example of United States, mm -hmm. and we look at the example of the multiple different religious faiths and traditions that are practiced here, most students at Temple University, where we're based right now, have been influenced by Christianity, mm -hmm. which has spawned capitalism as we know of it. These traditions, and even New Age traditions, these traditions are individualistic. Mm -hmm. They believe in an individual soul or an individual ego who needs to profit, who needs to be successful. And there's different ways as an individual that you can gain access to wealth or heaven, be it heaven on earth or heaven once you die. Mm -hmm. Now, this idea of an individual who needs to work hard who needs to prove their moral or spiritual worth is an individual endeavor mm -hmm. and it's human endeavor. It has nothing to do with any other animal or species on this planet. Yes, in Christianity, there's an idea of stewardship, but traditionally the idea was the earth was made for human. Now, since the colonial project, the Eurocentric view of the white man being the center of the universe, coming to North America, this idea of manifest destiny, this idea of this is ours to have. Everything around us was given to us, for us, mm -hmm. because we are made in God's image. Us, the white man, we are the privileged ones. Now, well, I think this is something that transcends race because you see this in so many cultures throughout the entire world, separated by space and time. Mm -hmm. So it's like something that is manifested through the uh, Eurocentric, Eurocentric colonialist wave that happened across um, the Northern Hemisphere. But I can't imagine this not happening throughout time with other races and cultures trying to um, create a space for themselves in nature to kind of, and you got to wonder, like, you know, nature is trying to kill us. You know, there are wolves, there are, there are predators. And when we live in a society that it's almost like an ark, you know, mm -hmm. we, we're, we're protect, like I walked here today without having to worry about being eaten. And I know that if I got an infection, I could go to the hospital get, and get antibiotics. Mm. So we are kind of contained and protected in this paternal arc of society. But there is this dimension of constant growth and um, individual ethic, which I think comes back to the Christian view of the sovereignty of the individual, which again, it's a yin yang thing because you can be too individualistic, mm -hmm. but also you can be not individualistic enough. And in some other cultures where the group is primary, I've heard this kind of same sentiment on the opposite side, because if you are nothing but part of a group, and if the group and the larger system is paramount, then your individual suffering or your individual death um, decreases in significance because it doesn't mean the death of the entire group. Mm -hmm. Looking at the individual as the sovereign and most divine point of uh, consciousness uh, allows pe people to exist along all dimensions of, of race and gender and ethnicity um, with the most amount of freedom. But how, how do the more collectivist cultures, how do they manage uh, 
kind of balancing out the exaggerated individuality um, in a more positive way. Well, if we take, for example, Native American traditions, mm -hmm. we have the Lakota Sioux, where they believe in Wakontanka. Wakontanka is pretty much a, a pan-theistic tradition which believes that everything, or probably even panentheistic, everything mm -hmm. resides in, in the holy. Mm -hmm. Or pantheistic, everything is a reflection of the holy. Mm -hmm. So it's the collective understanding is not so much that we as a group of humans, mm -hmm. it's the idea of the collective holistic self. Of everything. Everything. Yeah. So it's not, yeah. and I think this is the, once again, the, the problem with the human concept that we are not only better, but we're separate from mm -hmm. everything else. And the, the earth itself is not our destination. That instead, we have this idea that for us to claim enlightenment or to claim some form of um, individualistic epiphany, mm -hmm. we need to be separate. Yeah. And, but we understand that in order to become enlightened, we need to join the whole thing is there are some traditions that don't perceive ourselves to being separate already mm -hmm. and this is where we get to different forms of nature veneration in what kind of cultures do you see that we have multiple native american cultures mm -hmm. multiple indigenous cultures around the world mm -hmm. be it um, european african american asian this idea of the local the living in harmony with your local environment mm -hmm. that you play a specific purpose with your environment mm -hmm. and this becomes even more important when we start questioning how can we use religion to enhance environmental practices mm -hmm. it's by engaging with your local environment it starts with how do you treat your own body how do you treat the trees in your yard how do you have a relationship with the squirrels and the sparrows as you walk down the road instead of constantly looking and pursuing something far away you will look what's right in front of you you localize you your localize divinity. And yeah. you realize that you can be a part of a divine system. Mm -hmm. You can help regulate the system by doing positive things. Mm -hmm. And we can do it, obviously, in our own backyards, in our own communities. But we can see how this can impact on a larger scale, on an earth-based scale, mm -hmm. by believing that we're a part of this earth. Yeah, and th but there are a lot of nuances in... Uh, in revering and venerating nature and your local environment, something that I thought was really interesting that you taught me um, and I think really speaks to how religion can affect a, a human being's relationship to nature mm. is how in India there's a separation between physical purity and spiritual purity mm. where they meet their might be a river that is covered in a layer of plastic floating on top. Um, but it's a sacred river and people will go to that river every day and pray alongside the river. And that might be their way of um, being a steward to the spiritual essence of that place. But there's a separation between the material purity and the spiritual and divine purity. So you, you get, you, you, we need um, to find the religious practices that incorporated the material health of nature mm -hmm. as part of the spiritual health. Those things can't be separated. Absolutely. And we have to understand that in India, in this specific example, if we take the veneration of the Ganges, mm -hmm. this is coming from a specifically anthropocentric lens this is about humanity it's about transcending this um, reality transcending transcending the suffering that one can experience and trying to elevate ourselves to another state of consciousness this belief that the river is holy is separate from the idea of protecting the river so it's healthy mm -hmm. The river is holy because of the belief in darshan, the belief that the holy is within it mm -hmm. and that there is a goddess spirituality within the river. 
the river itself is not holy for itself. The water is not holy. The river is not holy. The, the, wa- the river is not being venerated because it's a river. Mm-hmm. It's being venerated because it's believed to be a goddess in a river form. Mm-hmm. So Hinduism can, can offer multiple examples of nature veneration. But is nature really being venerated in itself? Or is a mountain being venerated as Shiva? Mm-hmm. You know, are trees being venerated because they are trees or because they represent the three Murti, where you have the three gods as um, Shiva, um, Brahma and Vishnu, mm-hmm. where you have the creator Brahma as the roots. You have Vishnu, the preserver as the trunk and you have Shiva as the canopy. Mm-hmm. The tree in itself is not being venerated. Yeah. It's what the tree represents that's being venerated. Mm-hmm. And so even some traditions we have to be aware, they don't obviously really give us a platform. They give us examples. So many of the traditions that are world religions are world religions because they become delocalized. Christianity can be practiced anywhere. Islam can be practiced anywhere. Hinduism now theoretically can be practiced anywhere. They're diasporic traditions. The traditions we need to start looking at more closely are the localized ones, the ones that are venerating the nature around them specifically, not because of what they represent, but because they venerate the nature itself. And how that organism relates into the, in the web of life that we are situated in. And it, it's so unfortunate because we live our day-to-day life in this in the safety of the arc of the society that we live in. Mm. Um, but at the same time, we go to the grocery store and we get our meat in these nicely cut, packaged um, little morsels. And, mm. and we're not hunting for our food. We're not being in touch with the seasons uh, for growing our own food. We're not, we're not part of the processes of nature uh, for the sake of our own survival. Yeah. It's like people will say, like, I need more nature in my life. What they mean is they, like, want to go for a hike every now and then. Mm. They're not, like, kind of get in, they're not incorporating nature into their life in a way that would build a reverence or a veneration for it that would yeah. change that would extend their sense of self you know and um something that i that gives me a lot of hope and optimism is the uh increase in usage of ayahuasca and one of the common uh phenomenological experiences that people have on ayahuasca but even more broadly all of the plant hallucinogens like psilocybin is this feeling of oceanic oneness with everything Mm -hmm. it's like these these chemicals are characterized by their ability to dissolve your ego and show you that not even show you but take you away so uh the, your intrinsic connection with all of nature becomes so evident. Mm. And I think that this is this tells us a lot about what psychedelics could be because I think that psychedelics could be what's called an alimone. And an alimone is a, it's a chemical that one species creates to uh, affect the growth and reproduction of another species this is like flowers give off alimones to attract bees to come pollinate their flowers of course this helps the bee make honey and continue the beehive but it also helps the flower pollinate itself and and create more of itself and Mm. create an environment in which it can flourish and part of me thinks that psychedelics evolved alongside humanity Um, to cause this effect of nature veneration for the sake of the plants. Mm. You know, is is Mm. it possible that... uh, Have you ever seen the movie The Happening? Mm -hmm. Uh, In that movie, the trees realize that they're being threatened by humanity, so they develop a a chemical that they spread through the air that makes... um, 
causes human apoptosis pretty much where people just start killing themselves. That's kind of an example of obviously not an alimone because that's a, a plant destroying humanity. But what if psychedelics are the plant world's way of influencing our behavior through programming our religious belief to behave in ways that are in um, a symbiotic, mutually beneficial relationship with nature. And a lot of these Native American traditions have incorporated the use of psychedelics. Mm -hmm. Do you think there's any connection there? I think that there's a strong hypothesis there. I think that, once again, it's very anthropocentric to think that plants or other forms of species have any role in relationship with humans. Mm. I think this is once again us humans thinking that we have somehow more of a special role on this planet than any other animal or any other species that's come before us. We have existed on this planet for a blip Mm -hmm. of a moment and yet we still think that things are being created for us. Maybe these plants and mushrooms have tools that are designed to help the consciousness of this earth. Mm -hmm. Maybe us as humans have a special degree of consciousness that helps us regulate the system. Mm -hmm. But we have failed. Evidence suggests that we are not what we think we are. Maybe as deep ecologists suggest, we are a virus. You know, The Matrix, the movie, talks about us being a virus. Mm -hmm. Every Hollywood movie now about the environment challenges us as a virus, and yet humans still win. Mm -hmm. The thing is, as long as we believe that we have a special role that is somehow more important than any other species, we're still being anthropocentric. How do you wrestle with the idea that human beings... If, of course, there are ways in which human behavior is directly causing um, damage to the planet, ultimately, this is just going to, like, destroy us as a species. Because I still don't think humans are powerful enough, with the exception of nuclear bombs, Mm. to destroy the planet. It's kind of like what George Carlin said, you know we're worried about plastic in the oceans and destroying the planet, the planet's going to be fine. Mm. The planet's just going to shake us off like a bad case of fleas, you know? But how do you, how do you deal with the idea that if there was a, an asteroid impact or a super volcano eruption or some kind of climate catastrophe, humans are the only species that would be able to create an arc of life in a spaceship and remove and preserve life in light of the destruction of the earth even if it was being destroyed by something outside of human Mm. control in in that way we are something different than other animals in that we are the only animals that can preserve earth's biodiversity if an asteroid an un- unavoidable asteroid the mm. size of mount everest was heading our way yeah. you know isn't there some kind of significance in that maybe but once again <laughs> is it is it a bloated significance yeah. you know mushrooms can exist in space panspermia yeah. um some people like paul stamets believes that potentially mushrooms are aliens they come mm-hmm. from another um another dimension or another planet um bacteria could survive a meteor cockroaches could survive there are multiple beings that could survive again i just have this anthropocentric idea of scientists with test tubes on a spaceship being the only arc but but once again it's a one form of of life like we are obviously exceptional in the fact that we exist differently than many other animals but this bloated significance, this mm-hmm. bloated exceptionalism, this is still a result of the religions that have shaped our society. Mm-hmm. You know, if we start thinking of ourselves as a part of a self-regulating system, whereby humans had a role on this earth beyond us as individuals, if we start perceiving ourselves like mycelium, spreading underneath the soil, spreading information from tree to tree, from water source to water source, this neuron network underneath the soil. If we thought of ourselves as maybe a form of consciousness, 
that was a Gaia consciousness, an Earth consciousness, and that we weren't here for humans, we were here for the health of this Earth, then we would realize that everything in this self-regulating system has a role. Mm -hmm. Our physical body, we say the mind or the soul are the most important aspects, but my gosh, imagine without skin. Imagine the pain. Imagine what it's like without taste buds, chemoreceptors, without sight. You know, we have so many different functions in our body and we have to see it holistically. Mm -hmm. Our body works together. And yet, the most dominant way that we perceive this reality is humans versus everything else. Mm -hmm. The anthropocentric, shallow ecology of, well, maybe we need to find a religion in order for us to like help the environment. Yeah. You know, it's still this idea of like, we need to do something. Yeah. Really, what we need to do is Be to... Be more of what we are. Exactly. We need to go, well, what, what were we as animals? Yeah. What roles did we have that we forgot about? Maybe we shouldn't be talking. Mm -hmm. Maybe we should stop working. Maybe everybody should grow food. Yeah. And, you know, one of the, the um, things you've been discussing is this, this idea that nature is dangerous, that nature is trying to kill us. But nature is the only thing that gives us life. Yeah. Without nature, we wouldn't exist. We it's, are nature. It's how to, it's the, it's the eternal challenge, how to walk the middle way, how to walk the line between yin and yang. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. Buddhism talks about the middle way between eternalism and nihilism. Mm -hmm. You know, everything or nothing. And we've seen it now. It comes back into the popular fold with Bohemian Rhapsody winning the Oscars. Nothing really matters. Mm -hmm. Anyone can see. We've created the illusion that we do matter. Mm -hmm. And we've created this belief in angels and aliens that have created that this. we in somehow uh, we somehow identify yeah, with. we're not yeah. really from this earth we're actually some hybrid and that we're really special mm -hmm. but you could also maybe believe if there are aliens out there they're looking at us going oh dearie me they're not treating spaceship earth very well yeah so Look, there are multiple different religions which we can look at and see how they position themselves within nature, within the self-regulating system. For example, the Lakota Sioux, as I talked about earlier, with Wakon Tanka, they believe that buffalo and bears and different animals are above them in a spiritual hierarchy. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> so to what degree do we need to reconfigurate and reevaluate our relationship using religion it's tricky because every religion is localized and specific we have the religions we have been raised in in europe and the united states aren't localized anymore and they're globalized and so we can look at buddhism we can look at hinduism we can look at shintoism confucianism taoism lakota khan when it comes to lakota we can look at all these different traditions but none of them were created specifically for the position we're in right now. Mm -hmm. Well, I think that some, sometimes I feel like our um, kind of the religious structures that we've inherited are seem to be like skeletons of what they used to be. And I think yeah. the, the flesh to the skeleton of a lot of these religious traditions is the use of um, psychoactive sacraments, even Christianity. Uh, mm. John Marco Allegro, who wrote the book *The Sacred Mushroom and the Cross*, posits that even the beginning of uh, even Christianity started as a mushroom fertility cult. You know, um, yeah. that that ceremonialized the use of Amanita muscaria, fly fly agaric mushrooms. Uh, and I think that when you look at a lot of these religions, you see evidence for past use of psychedelic drugs and i think that or what role do you think psychedelics played in early religions and what have we lost from taking out our um ceremonial incorporation of these substances yeah i think it's it's once again it's hypothetical yeah there are many examples of and archaeological finds where we can see that psychedelics have influenced civilizations. 
And if we're looking at recent example in the United States of how psychedelics were brought back into popular culture as a part of the counterculture movement from the 40s onwards, we can see that these different forms of psychedelic substances have helped generations to realize that there was something maybe we're missing. Mm -hmm. Maybe we shouldn't be obsessed with money or maybe we shouldn't be fighting wars in other continents and maybe there is a power in a flower. Um, maybe we should live liminally and live on the outside of society and grow our own food and the counterculture movement is completely intertwined with the re-embracing of psychedelics. How much can we rely upon psychedelics as a part of a, a global consciousness to develop and change? I think we're seeing it. Mm -hmm. I think the 1960s created the greatest counter counterculture movement where in we the West. woke up to the effect that we're Absolutely. having on the ecosystem. And I think that be it the feminist movement, the environmental movement, and um, the social rights movement, the Native American uh, movement, all of them happening in that era, there's a movement towards recognizing that maybe there's a greater whole which we're separate from. And, and once again, the anthropocentric illusion is, well, that greater whole must be some greater meaning beyond this earth. Mm -hmm. But I see the greater whole just being the earth itself. We don't need another dimension. We don't need another heaven. We need to reconfigure our relationship with everything on this planet yeah. and apologize and be grateful. Apologize and be grateful for everything we've done and everything we have. You know, as long, Leo Tolstoy said this, as long as there are slaughterhouses, there will be battlefields. Mm -hmm. As long as we continue to persecute, destroy, and exploit anything, the karmic effect will be that we will be suffering. Mm -hmm. It's potentially too late to solve our climate change, the global warming we're experiencing right now, to the fact that maybe we can't exist in the same way that we used to. But maybe we don't want to live the same way that we used to. Maybe we need to re member why we exist on this planet as something not for human interest and if psychedelics has a role to play in that process maybe it's so that people stop and turn around and start nurturing life instead of thinking about death instead of thinking about one's own ego journey start thinking about life on this planet as an extension of ourselves as an extension of the fact that we are life, mm -hmm. that we are a part of a, an earth which is cyclical, that spins around a sun, going nowhere as we know it. We have no idea where we're going. We're expanding somewhere. We're in the midst of chaos. And yet we're on this planet which has so much life. We are like on a, a will of bliss where things can exist, or we can perceive ourselves on a will of suffering, which we need to escape from. Thinking mm. that the earth and life itself is somehow our prison. Like a dirty, dangerous yeah. place that we need to escape from. And it's, it's funny, it's from you where I first learned about Pure Land Buddhism. And in Pure Land Buddhism, there yeah. could, could you explain Pure Land Buddhism? So Pure Land Buddhism traditionally um, um, put forward the sociological belief of salvation like in many traditions mm -hmm. that we need to transcend this will of suffering mm -hmm. and there were um, these multiple Buddha realms that you could transcend to and this is not like many other Buddhist traditions because most Buddhist traditions don't believe there is a heaven or that you have a soul so mm -hmm. to believe in another Buddhist realm um, obviously is not necessarily from the Buddhist teachings, but must have been some cultural influence along the way. Mm. And what's happened in the 20th century, which is so fascinating, we can see how current 
um, appreciation of the environment and our need to do something has had an impact on Pure Land Buddhism. Because now Pure Land Buddhism talks about heaven being on earth instead of on another Buddha realm. Yeah, before it was characterized by there being a pure land. Exactly. Which seems to be uncharacteristic of Buddhism as a whole because Alan Watts, I think, said it um, really concisely, better than I've ever heard anyone say it. He said that one of the differences between um, Western tradition and Eastern, the Eastern tradition of Buddhism, uh, say between Christianity and Buddhism, is that Christianity is concerned with the supreme being and Buddhism is concerned with the supreme state of mm. being. Mm. And sometimes that state of being that is grounded in your presentness you are more influenced to see your connection with your immediate environment because it, it, it it's that's the most sacred thing yeah. that your interaction with your environment and with yourself when when we hold our views on about divinity in some kind of external supreme being that becomes idolized and worshipped we become pulled out of our um out of our socio socio ecological uh net the web that we exist in you know yeah you know Karl marx spoke about how religion is the opium of the masses it keeps us consumed it gives us some hope of salvation beyond the societal structure that we're mm -hmm. raised in and so instead of there being this focus on a state of being and how we can change the dynamic. It's about focusing on where we're going to go when we die. Yeah. And Buddhism, this is why Buddhism is sometimes referred to as a philosophy rather than a religion, because it has less theory about what happens to us after life and more theory about how to exist in a blissful, equanimous state here and now. Mm -hmm. um, once again, the interesting question is to what degree we can exist as animals and still perceive ourselves to be spiritual beings mm -hmm. for so long where's the balance where's the balance because for so long being an animal meant having no spiritual worth being savage being wild not having any civilized purpose but maybe our real purpose is to be animal mm-hmm and that the ultimate concern, Paul Tillich, who's a, a religious theorist, talks about how religion is our ultimate concern. What drives us? Now, if what drives us is ensuring that our environment doesn't collapse, then that becomes our religion. Mm -hmm. Simply pursuing an environmentally friendly life can be our religion. We don't have to believe in a deity. We don't have to believe in an afterlife. We don't even have to think of ourselves as animals or change anything. Just if we focus on being environmentally friendly, that could be our ultimate concern and mm -hmm. religion. Do you, do you ever feel, you know, Richard Dawkins obviously wrote the very famous book, The Selfish Gene, where one of the ways our evolutionary, one of the ways the evolutionary process has um, expressed itself in our behavior is that we are constantly looking to, um, we're looking out for ourselves. We're looking out to secure the propagation of our own genes and mm -hmm. our own means. Do you feel like this is an intrinsic dynamic to uh, that keeps the wheels of evolution turning, that, that this individuality and ego could be sourced um, by are the nature of life itself as it propagates through you know genetic variation and, and growth it could that could it possibly be that our nature in some way is at odds with treating life outside of ourselves as more divine than our own i think it can be interpreted like that whether or not we have to perceive um, life outside ourselves is more divine is once again slightly problematic. So it's specious to, or once again we're putting some form of hierarchy on the divine. Mm. If we perceive everything as divine, if we perceive that everything is in pursuit of growth, of life, of thriving, 
then okay everything has some selfish gene in order to survive mm -hmm. but if we understand humanity as a part of a greater whole as the earth then like the human body our kidney is not trying to beat our hearts our hearts not trying to win over our lungs yeah. you know our fingers aren't trying to not in a competition with our toes you know my little fingernail is not screaming with joy because it's longer than my index fingernail we have this idea that somehow competition and survival of the fittest is truth mm -hmm. we've come to believe that the science that is the foundation of our society right now is truth mm -hmm. however vandana shiva donna haraway many post modernist feminists have argued science in itself is eurocentric is misogynistic is um, imperialistic it's not truth it's a lens mm. we can shift our lens and get knowledge from different realms mm. we can take ayahuasca and learn a truth that might take hundreds of years of scientific knowledge to get mm -hmm. you still might get the same truth um, a thought experiment that I have played with myself when thinking and wrestling with I these ideas is um, if there was a bus hurling down Broad Street and in the middle of the road, there was a baby polar bear, the last polar bear on earth mm. and my child. And I only had time to save one of them. I would save my child. And I, I believe that that's the moral thing to do. Like, how would people respond if I took the polar bear instead of my own baby? Mm. I feel like people would look down on that, even though it was the last polar bear. Uh, even though it's, even though we are all part of life and connected from life and not separate, I still feel like the intrinsic morality that I feel like I've inherited as the result of my genes leads me to want to save my own child over the polar bear even though there are eight billion humans mm -hmm. and we can you know wax philosophically about how humans are destroying nature it doesn't matter i'm saving my child you know what i mean i do but i think at the same time the difficulty is because it's your child right mm -hmm. um if we can see the even if it was any if it was a human baby not not even even a child that mm. wasn't mine and a polar bear i would i i would save the human and and, and i think it's because we need to have a love for humanity that is balanced with the love for nature but i think that the love for our own species in some way maybe not has to be greater but it seems more moral if it is greater because i think it would be immoral to not save a human child from that situation mm. and to save the polar bear instead it's an extreme situation yeah it's just one of those um, thought experiments no no i see what you mean i think the is it a selfish gene that you want to save your child or a human over another animal perhaps where does that does it, moral impulse come from i guess is well, my question is it a moral impulse have we always had this sense that humans are separate from everything else mm. potentially the question is to what degree we've come so far removed mm. that it isn't just a question about whether we save a polar bear or, or a human it's the question that we would never even see the worth in saving a polar bear mm. only the human the fact you're having the quandary whether i should save the polar bear or the human shows a massive development right mm. seeing that the that there is worth to exactly. the last polar bear but, yeah or even if it's just a polar bear mm. you know seeing mm -hmm. that there's yeah. worth in yeah, every true. living form yeah. now if it's the case that in this moment the only thing you're thinking is i need to save this my child then we can see how anthropocentric that is mm. but the fact that you're even questioning wait a minute that polar bear it's the last polar bear so it really it's really important and it's a polar bear so it has life and it has 
a right to exist that's important that's a major development in yeah. human thinking yeah that's major that's because you know, most other animals wouldn't even abstractly cognize the situation they would save their own potentially yeah we, we would think that but we also have many examples of killer whales dolphins bears saving other wolves animals. saving humans yeah. right as, as potentially as other animals we see dogs um raising tiger cubs we've seen cats you know raising rabbits so we, we see um inter um intersectional animal behavior um looking after each other but we've created this dynamic where we perceive for so long humans to be separate we've had this anthropocentric lens for so long that it's hard for us to see the value in the changes that are happening right now there are changes the environmental degradation and the global warming that we're confronted with is forcing us to change. Mm -hmm. But over the 20th century, we've been seeing these slow changes happening. We first give rights and recognition for other humans who are not white men. And then we start recognizing that maybe we need to think about other beings beyond humans. Mm -hmm. You know, the dialogue of speciesism written by Peter Singer from the 70s and 80s this was revolutionary at the time to even consider there is such a thing as being speciest mm -hmm. so the fact that you're thinking about a polar bear and it's right to live is massive yeah the que the fact you would probably still save the child well it's understandable you're still raised in a, such an anthropocentric lens you went to university where it was all about you as an individual you go get a job which is about you as an individual you start a relationship with someone else who is an individual it's individualism everywhere and it's become globalized so more and more the individualistic anthropocentric capitalist model exists in every country mm -hmm. however the charge to change our relationship with the environment is happening it exists children are running around screaming this is our future you're destroying maybe right now the adults the government are not doing enough but i tell you what by the time we're in our 50s and 60s the generations who have to deal with this there'll be a reckoning and they'll be saying who took account who spoke openly about this who is doing something about it who's writing the manifestos who's creating the new religions why practice a religion that is anthropocentric that is misogynistic why you can reinterpret if you want but why reinterpret when you can create a new mm. the whole idea of an artist is to create new visions the whole role of being a religious leader a shaman a spiritual practitioner is to create the opportunity so that people can be creative that people can love and be dynamic if we're constantly trying to look into the past for answers we're only going to see the mistakes that people have made. Mm -hmm. And yes, we can use them in order to change how we interrelate. But really, the dynamic we're in right now demands a whole new paradigm. A paradigm that maybe takes some inspiration from localized traditions. But really, the only way we're going to salvage this planet for us is if we perceive us as not just humans. Mm -hmm. And that's deeper ecology. We need to think deeper. We need to think of ourselves not as just human, but maybe as earthlings, animals. And we need to start creating the dynamic so other beings can flourish, not just humans. You know, if there are animals that potentially could threaten us, give them space. If there are animals that need heat or warmth, give them heat or warmth. They need cold, they need food. We need to enable all life. Instead of thinking, okay, well, for us to thrive as humans, we need to get rid of this, we need to get rid of that, we need to exploit this. Instead it'd be like, no, 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 no. no. If we want to th thrive, then we need to start seeing everything else thrive, thrive around with us. us. Yeah. With us, yeah. And yes, there are religions and philosophies and traditions that have practiced this on localized examples. And yes, there are new traditions 
Gaia theory, Gaia philosophy, Gaia mm-hmm. religion, neo-pagan traditions. There, many of them are flourishing. But how many of them consider themselves as animals? How many of them talk about humans as animals? It's hard to find. There's so much emphasis on us as humans, as humanity, that there's no real talk of animality. Mm. And, hey, if I was an alien and I was up there looking down, I would not be impressed. And maybe that alien, as evolved in its thinking as it could be, sees its own animality. Yeah. And that's why it wouldn't be impressed. Yeah. Because even on Earth, we are an, we are an extension of all life in yeah. the universe. Well, we're, we're an extension of the Earth consciousness. Mm-hmm. We came from the Earth. Unless you believe that some alien race or angels plopped us down here, which is a whole other belief system. Mm -hmm. But as long as you believe that we're from the earth, then we are an extension of the earth. Mm -hmm. And the earth is an extension of the universe. And we are a part of the earth. And therefore, if we have any role or purpose, it is of the earth. Mm -hmm. And yet we've created this human purpose, this human endeavor. And religions are platforms or excuses in order for us to pursue these linear understandings of transcending and going to other states of being. But we can change the platform. Mm -hmm. We can change the paradigm. We can simply just start calling ourselves animals instead of humans. We could start recognizing the divinity of a cockroach equal to the divinity of any other life form. But that's a choice. And it needs to be chosen. It can't be forced. You can't force belief systems on people. You need to lead them to see. Yeah, you need to lead lead as an example. So one of the things you discussed earlier was people go and spend time in nature, not to really spend time in nature, but to do exercise like hiking or running or even parkour, right? Mm -hmm. To go do something. It's very rare to go somewhere like the Wissahickon in Philadelphia and see people walking slowly and observing trees and touching plants and putting soil on their face or cupping water from a stream. Instead, they're running around in their... Foam sneakers. Whatever they're wearing, you know, lycra multicolored flashing things got their music on carrying their running with their water bottles and they're in nature and yet they're as much in nature as their human body is within clothes Mm -hmm. they don't really realize they're in nature they're just performing exercise within nature and so one of the things i like to say to myself is you need to walk slowly through the forest the action of walking slowly will stop people in their tracks and ask themselves why am i running so quickly so it's there needs to be examples there needs to be behavior which reflects the animality which reflects the appreciation of the divine in all things mm-hmm. that religion is still becoming it needs to be created in its own time Mm -hmm. it can't be forced and maybe in 300 years if humanity survives um, this crisis we're in it will be because people have generated an appreciation of the divine on earth Mm -hmm. and it will be as normal to see someone meditating under a tree as it is now to see someone looking at their phone in mcdonald's yeah you know but it's, it's every little attempt we make to uh, embrace our animality that will start realizing that everything is divine. There's nothing that's more divine or less divine. Anything that exists must have divine in it. But everything we've been taught 
has made humans the center of the universe. Mm -hmm. So to get into that way of thinking, one has to, yes, look at other traditions that have created a platform for humans to be a part of uh, some form of nature-based appreciation. But also it's, it's reimagining because we're not localized anymore. We're global. So we need to start thinking not just about a local area, which is divine, but it's like how the whole earth it's Demo one network. Yeah, and demands, <clears throat> like mycelium running underneath the surface, demands some form of consciousness to realize itself. Mm -hmm. And maybe that's what we are. But we've got so lost in our own track of human consciousness and human exceptionalism that all our religions create this platform of some being in white appearing in the sky and there being this, ah, and we all transcend. If there's going to be a being in the sky and it's going to tran and things are going to transcend, squirrels, dogs, cows. Well, in a way, the sun all... is that. The yeah. sun is that nature-based, floating divine angels in the sky, giving us yeah. all life. Exactly. You know, and the sun seems to be in the basis of a lot of these religions. The sun is the yeah. god. Yeah. You know, and the moon. Mm -hmm. we, we, we have multiple different religious traditions that have had these divine appreciations of all the different earth relationships with the moon, the sun, mm -hmm. Venus, different planetary systems. We have traditions that have had this understanding of trees being divine, water systems being divine. We have all these different knowledges most of them have slipped to the side during the enlightenment christian dominated imperialistic project now they're seeping back to the surface mm -hmm. and we're going oh maybe lakoa khan do have some really good ideas Ooh, maybe taoism could be helpful and we're seeing how scholars are appreciating and reinterpreting traditions and we're seeing how traditions are reinterpreting themselves so we have green christianity um we have green judaism we have the idea of um, buddhism practicing some form of pure land ethics but there will always be re reinterpretations of an old model what fascinates me are the models that get created specifically in order to deal with what we have right now. Yeah. So we, ha we live in a digital age. <clears throat> so to what point are we going hit to hit this religion where we worship AI? Mm -hmm. To what point are we going to start um, challenging our meat industry and dairy industry so that we don't eat animals anymore? And then if we don't eat animals anymore and we don't um, enslave animals anymore in our agricultural um, hell holes that exist, our concentrating animal feeding operations, what will our relationship with animals be like? Mm -hmm. How do we create a society that, how does it facilitate a reality where we don't exploit animals? So it's not so much that we create a religion in order to stop the exploitation, it's also the question of, well, what will religion look like when we don't exploit animals? Mm -hmm. In that way, religion and philosophy is as much organic in its cultural flows, as Thomas Tweed talks about, as any form of orga organic organism is. It flows and it changes when it meets other boundaries and it meets other networks. So that we have religions in like, the, um, the Caribbean, which have Celtic, Christian, um, Yoruba, um, multiple different traditions coming together to create a diasporic, syncretic tradition. They're unique. And I think that we have to understand that beyond utilizing religions to help create a different perspective of our relationship with everything, we also have to understand how in some ways, religions exist outside of us mm -hmm. and are created after something's happened. Mm -hmm. So I think that we're seeing right now a need for a paradigm shift. 
and we're utilizing different traditions and beliefs and practices in order to enable us to have that paradigm shift but then once we have the paradigm shift if we do have the paradigm shift who knows what we'll believe in yeah and who knows what will be in contact with us when they're like okay now they've reached another level of understanding we can now make contact with them <laughs> yeah well tom you're doing a great job with ushering in a new consciousness on this subject and you mentioned you're writing something called the animality manifesto where and when can people see that and how can people learn more about you and more about this subject that is so important um, well, I'm, at the moment, I'm doing my research on this manifesto. Um, I have stumbled upon so many different um, discussions on speciesism and the ways we need to challenge our species models. But I'm still realizing there isn't enough information about how we can actually truly change this model mm -hmm. by a paradigm shift. And so I'm going to be writing this manifesto called the Animality Manifesto, mm -hmm. and I'm hoping to have it finished in the next year. And um, I'll probably, by that time, um, in the next year or two, I'm going to create um, my own website, mm -hmm. right? Can offer these things more to the general public. Because the problem with academia is that it's once again quite privileged. Unless you know what to find or what to look for, it's not really available. And a lot of the way that academics is written is for an academic audience. It's insulated. It's insulated. So in order to make this knowledge more available, um, I will be creating a platform on the internet for it. And I can keep you updated on that. For sure. I'll make, sure that, I'll make sure that gets out. And uh, I think we should do another podcast when it does to Absolutely. revisit these issues and and explore the development of your thinking as you continue to pursue this philosophy and this, this, this crucial shift that both is happening and is also being pushed into reality by people like yourself. Um, so Tom, thanks again for doing this, man. Thank, Thank you very much for having me. Peace, everyone. Thanks again for listening to the Lifting the Iceberg podcast. Dr. Brent is not currently active on social media, but within the next year, he will be upon release of his new book, The Animality Manifesto. So stay tuned and I will be posting about that when it is released. You can stay up to date on any new podcasts at LiftingTheIceberg.com or by following Lifting the Iceberg on Facebook and Instagram. This podcast is available on Spotify, iTunes, and YouTube. Thank you to Alexis Spatty for designing the graphics for this podcast. You can find her at alexispatty.com. Thank you to Kurusu for the soundtrack Stay With Me. You can find Kurusu on Spotify, YouTube, and SoundCloud. Mm -hmm.